respond as we go. Okay, so uh, good morning everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Bob McKay. I'm an account manager at Perfect Image and I'm here with Peter Dinsdale, our data protection consultant. Morning everybody. Um, so we'll just run through the agenda for the webinar and then I'll hand over to Peter who's going to kick things off um, around the GDPR piece. Yes, so just to kind of give you a really kind of quick overview of what's been happening with GDPR since May, uh, looking at ICO enforcement action in particular, but also talking about some of the ongoing GDPR work that we all should now be starting to look at and how Perfect Image might be able to help you with some of this work. Okay, so on the cybersecurity front, um, I'll briefly discuss where we feel companies are most vulnerable, um, run through what Perfect Image can do, the areas we can help you in, and then um, on to a little bit of the fun stuff. I'm going to give an example of a real um, social engineering piece or attack and an actual live hack of a website. Um, it's my website, so I won't be breaking the law, so you won't be implicated in any way. Okay. And of course, we'll uh, yeah. leave a little bit of time at the end for Q&A, but as Bob said, if you do have any comments or questions as we go through, please pop them up on chat and we'll be happily trying to answer them as best we can as we go through. So without further ado, let's talk a little bit about GDPR. Hopefully we were all quite busy in the lead up to the 25th of May. Uh, felt like there was a bit of a mad panic certainly in my world in that lead up. My mailbox was definitely full of an awful lot of emails related to GDPR asking me to confirm that I still wish to receive their marketing messages. There was plenty of articles in the papers talking about GDPR, how it might affect individuals and companies. There were plenty of uh, scare stories about the countdown to the deadline, about businesses being unprepared for GDPR as the deadline edges closer, and of course fines. Fines were quite a, quite a topic of discussion in the lead up, but you might kind of feel after that there's been nothing much happening. Does that mean it's been a bit of a damp squib? I'd say no. Um, it was always going to be a bit of a low after that initial burst of activity. And the fact is that the first fines and other enforcement activity, they could still be months away. This just reflects the amount of time it takes the Information Commissioner's Office to conduct their investigations. They have confirmed that they're dealing with their first GDPR cases, but it's too early to speculate at the minute as to whether they'll lead to fines or other processing bans. So, what have they been doing? They have been busy. We might not have had any action under GDPR in terms of fines yet, but in terms of their enforcement action, here's just a few facts and figures for you. Since that 25th of May deadline, they've actually issued fines to 16 companies under the old Data Protection Act, as well as the existing Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations. That's been over two and a half million pounds worth. And to give you a slightly wider comparative picture, in 2017 there were 54 fines in total, averaging around 78,000. And 2018 in total to date, we've had 37 fines, but look at that average, that's nearly double. In fact, that's over double, 157, nearly 158,000. So I think that gives you a good kind of indicator that they are definitely seeking to ramp up their enforcement activity. So you think this is sort of the, the shape of things to come as far as the way fines are going and, and from the um, from the Information Commissioner's office? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's obviously guesswork at the minute, but the supposition has to be that they're looking at the fact that they've got these new fining powers and that is reflected in how they're actually enforcing the old laws. So, yeah, yeah I think that's definitely an indication of the direction of travel. Yeah, okay. Um, obviously... Worth reiterating, none of these are under the GDPR yet, uh, all under the old regimes. We have had two of the first fines issued under GDPR across Europe. That was in Austria and Portugal. You can Google those if you're really interested in them. I certainly am, but uh, that's just uh, <laughs> my data protection degree coming out a little bit. <laughs> no comment there. So what other activities do the ICO undertake? They actually offer something that you might find useful, to be honest with you. They offer audits and advisory visits 
and since the 1st of June they've reported 77 of these have taken place. Uh, what happens is they'll come on site for a day, you'll get a visit from one of their teams, they'll just ask you some questions, look in detail at your processing of personal data, and they'll give you a report with an action plan on how to improve things. I mean, you would almost say potentially it's a little bit of free consultancy for you. So you can actually request an advisory visit, it's not something they sort of push on people? It's both, yes, right. it's something that you can voluntarily sign up for, but okay. also, I can't, again, like if you come across their radar, it's something they may ask you to undertake at their request, so it's a two-way thing. Okay, presumably if it comes from you first, it, 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 would, it would generate some goodwill with the ICO, which you seem to be so proactive that you're asking them to come and audit you. Yeah, absolutely, I think engagement with the regulator can only ever be a good thing, and in these cases, they would be giving you it as an educational piece. They're not going to take action against you, I would say, for the things that they find when they're on site. Yeah. And in the event of a future breach, you can point to this as good evidence that you've sought to engage and that you are actually a responsible data controller, yeah. yeah. Okay. At the minute, the free offering is only for SMEs, charities, and not-for-profits. Uh, but you can get in touch with them if you're, if you're not in that category and see if they'll come on board and do a visit perhaps at a cost, I'm not sure. You would need to kind of speak to them about their offering in that kind of case. Mm. They have, oh, I'll come back to that, they have actually confirmed one action so far under GDPR themselves. It's an enforcement notice. There's been quite a bit of press recently about the Cambridge Analytica and Facebook interference potentially in the Brexit referendum and other elections. They have actually an enforcement notice against a company called Aggregate IQ who are involved in that activity and that forces this company to delete a data set containing UK citizen data that might be used for political marketing. So that is the first confirmed bit of activity. And the final little bit of activity, oh, here we go, from the ICO. They've issued maximum fines under the old laws for Equifax and Facebook. You might well have seen those in the press recently. They have confirmed that, certainly in the Facebook instance, if it was under GDPR, that would have been a significantly higher fee. The fact that they have issued the first and only maximums in recent months, again, another direct indication of where they're looking to go with this enforcement just, activity. Just to remind me, what, what, so Facebook's obviously a huge global company. What's yeah. the maximum fine under the new regime, under GDPR? Well, that would be... It's based on global revenue? Well, it would be 20 million euros or up to 4% of global annual revenue, whichever's higher. So in <laughs> Facebook, that would be yeah, yeah. getting into the billions. Right. So yeah, absolutely would be significantly higher than the half a million they've been hit by. Okay, interesting. Yeah. And finally, just to kind of let you know that certainly in certain industries, it's not just the ICO that can take action. Recently, the Financial Conduct Authority fined Tesco Bank 16.4 million for a cyber attack that they suffered in 2016. And on top of that, Tesco was forced to repay two and a half million pounds in losses to the 9,000 customers who'd actually suffered loss as a result of that breach of their website. So if anybody is in the financial industry. I'm sure you're probably already aware of that, but it's another one to be aware of. So potential future action. I've mentioned that the ICO are actually currently investigating breaches under GDPR, and at the minute it's speculation as to which ones might result in fines, but here's a few of them that uh, certainly you might have picked up in the press. Dixon's car phone in June had a huge breach of their website. This led to the compromise of 5.9 million card records. They initially said it was 1.2 million customer records, but further investigation, they upgraded that to 10 million customer records. Uh, the breach took place in, I think, September 2017, but they didn't discover it until after GDPR was in force. So I think the ICO are currently slightly torn as to which legal regime applies. This was was this a WordPress breach? I, I believe it was, it was it? a WordPress vulnerability. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that'll uh, that'll become more relevant later on when I um, when I show you us actually uh, breaching or attacking a WordPress site um, and show you how easy it, it it can be. Yeah, absolutely. And you'll see that it's 
bit of a recurring theme through a lot of these breaches yeah, as yeah. they come from particularly website vulnerabilities. Another one of which is, of course, back in September, the British Airways breach. Another one where they upgraded the number of potentially affected customers quite recently after further investigation. I think it was initially about 300,000, now it's up to 429,000 customers they believe might have been affected in total. Mm. Absolutely classic demonstration of the number of potential consequences that a business could suffer as a result of a breach. They have promised that they will compensate anybody that suffers a loss as a result of it. Internally, they have to suck up the costs of mitigating and managing the breach and also the huge press fallout as a result of it. But also, you might have noticed that in the reports, the day after the breach was announced, their share price had dropped by 3.1%, so another significant potential consequence for them. And finally, even without before the breach might have taken place, they could be forced to pay out, as it seems that the no-win, no-fee industry has started to take a look at data breaches. The website I've linked to there, badatabreach.com, not bad data breach, as uh, we initially yeah. thought it said, uh, although it wasn't a good data breach. Uh, yes, this company are trying to get people who've been affected by the breach to sign up as part of a potential group action, and they're looking to claim up to £1,500 on behalf of everybody that was affected. Whether or not it'll be successful is a different matter, but if it is, I did a quick kind of back of a fag pack of calculation that the total compensation fee for that, if all 429,000 received 1,500, would be 643.5 million pounds. So, yeah, on yeah. top of the fines on top and of the fines yeah. and all of the other costs that, and the compensation for losses that they've had to pay. So, yeah, yes, I'm very yeah. much a case study in. Uh, what can go wrong? Yeah. This one, the Conservative Party you might have seen, but this one is uh, probably more embarrassing and amusing than serious. But their app was actually vulnerable because they didn't have suitable authentication in place. You could sign up for your account just with your email address, and that allowed people to go in and see the personal mobile numbers and other details of all of the MPs and journalists and other delegates that were attending the conference and who'd signed up for the app, so uh, made the papers. It's been investigated by the ICO, but I suspect one more likely to be uh, embarrassing than financially consequential. Mm. And finally, our friends at Facebook have been busy. They've had another one where a feature of their website which allowed you to view your account details was compromised and they think up to 30 million user accounts might be potentially affected by this. I think Bob you know a little bit more about how that actually works. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's um it's to do with the functionality within Facebook um the, the view as functionality which lets you use uh, view your profile as another person whether it be a friend of a friend um or how it looks public facing if you have that allowed. Um, there was an issue in the code. Uh, it meant that people could actually flick through um, profiles that they shouldn't have had access to and um, siphon the data off. So yeah, uh, something that we keep coming back to more and more is about security settings and keeping your patches up to date as well. So, yeah. yeah. So in terms of lessons learned from these breaches, I mean, we've got this fairly stern-looking fella here. That is. Otto von Bismarck, who said, only a fool learns from his own mistakes. The wise man learns from the mistakes of others. So we can all actually learn from the mistakes of others who've suffered data breaches and had a monetary penalty as a result of it. The ICO's website under this link actually takes you to details of the reports of the enforcement action they've taken. And it takes you through the mistakes that the company's made that led to the breaches. And I think it's a really useful tool to use to kind of inform your own risk profiles and to kind of identify the things that might be threats to your own infrastructure. To kind of give you a case in point, I've done a little brief anatomy of the Equifax breach. In this, as we said, I think that was another website compromise and this one led to the compromise of up to 15 million UK individuals records and was of course one of those two maximum uh, £500,000 
disciplinary penalty notices. This was the first ever maximum under the old Act. And there's another one where they're facing a group legal action from another no win, no fee solicitors. There's a link if you just search for Equifax hack, you could find the link to that. And I can't, don't know what they're search, they're probably looking for about another four figure sum for all of those 15 million. So you can do the maths yourself on that one. Not an insignificant amount of money. So what brought about, brought about the breach? It's all detailed in the ICO's report into why they've issued the fine. What they were doing was they were processing some of their UK customer data in the systems of the US parent company and what they failed to do was remove it once that processing had taken place. Um, fortunately, the US company was then breached, exploiting a web application vulnerability. The US the company had actually been told by the Department of Homeland Security that this vulnerability existed in March 2017. It was patched in some instances, but not in all instances because they weren't all picked up by their scan. And I believe it was therefore open for a good six months, this vulnerability. They did have in place an intrusion prevention system which should have noticed encrypted traffic being taken from their website that was stealing this sensitive data. But unfortunately, that system was not working because their SSL certificate had expired. It expired in January 2016 and they didn't fix it until July 2017. So there's a clear four or five month window there where the website is open to this vulnerability and they aren't actually checking the traffic that's coming out of it. Further exacerbated by the fact that the breach was finally discovered, I believe in July or August 2017, but the US company failed to tell the UK subsidiary that it had happened for another month. So they weren't able to tell their customers or tell the ICO about the breach until it had long after it had been discovered. And uh, all of these things, all of these factors, they were technical, they were process, they were people error. All of these things went together in the report to say this is a serious breach and we are actually taking you to the maximum level of fine. So definitely one that's worth uh, looking at, learning from, seeing where they went wrong and seeing where perhaps you might be able to improve your own systems and processes. Mm. Just on the delay there, you mentioned that the, the US um, arm of the company didn't tell the UK for a month. So, I mean, in, under the new regime, under GDPR, you have 72 hours, isn't it? Is that That's right? right, yes, 72 hours yeah. from discovery of breach to actually notify the ICO of breaches that would lead to kind of harm or prejudice to individuals' rights. So. That wouldn't look great, and I think it was exacerbated by the fact that they didn't have a kind of contract in place between themselves and their parent company that would actually require them to notify them within that time. Right, okay. So, so yeah. back to policies and procedures again. Exactly. So it's a, it's a kind of failure across the piece, really. It's not just a technical technological error. It's yep. exacerbated and compounded by their procedural failings as well. Okay. So what are some of the things that you probably should be doing now? You've obviously had this huge deluge of activity and communications up to the 25th of May, but there are still things that we should be doing to comply with GDPR. Obviously, you should be responding to requests and issues as they arise. These things will be coming in on a reactive basis. You can't predict them, but you know that they will happen. We should also be considering, for example, security assessments. We've already learned that having things out of date and vulnerabilities in place lead to breaches. So if you have kind of a monthly, quarterly, whatever you feel is appropriate assessment of your security posture and your security measures, you should be then putting enough in place to make sure that they're up to date and they are keeping you at a good level of security. Slightly wider, you could be re regularly auditing, monitoring and reviewing your entire compliance piece look at the effectiveness of the policies and procedures you've put in place, make sure they're actually being embedded into day-to-day -day business as usual practice. Assess any new vendors and third parties that you bring on board, make sure that they're offering you a suitable level of security and data protection. Review your records of process and activities and the evidence base that you put in place to demonstrate that you do comply with the law. Obviously these are never going to be static documents as you're always going to be developing your business, bringing on new projects and process and activities. 
draft new privacy notices to make sure that they reflect these new projects and process activities. And also, as part of the project's uh, kind of process, you're going to be looking to complete and review your data protection impact assessments. They're kind of your little risk assessments up front to make sure that the projects that you're undertaking are actually designed with data protection and security in mind. And how can we help you with that? Well, we can obviously give you some consultancy and training on any specific areas or general areas of GDPR and security that you might be interested in. If you're still at more of an early stage in your compliance journey, we can definitely carry out an assurance assessment for you. We've done that with clients before. It's just a kind of gap analysis that leads to a customized action plan for you to give you a kind of push in the right direction. So also assurance that a lot of the stuff you're already doing is pretty good and will help you comply anyway. In addition to this, we can help you with data protection compliance auditing, data flow data set auditing and mapping. We can provide you with either assistance with drafting your procedures for dealing with subject data subject requests, but I can also provide resource and help you to work through those requests if they're not something you've done to date. Uh, obviously, they're quite new to quite a lot of industries. Third party and vendor assessment, we can help you design your procedures and questionnaires for carrying out these assessments, but also in interpreting the results that you get back to make sure that you're satisfied with the level of security they're offering you. We can give you assistance with drafting policies, guidance notes, privacy notices, advice on mailing list management, when you do and don't need consent, and what kind of information you need to give to people about the market and you're actually sending out can help with guidance or undertaking the data protection impact assessments. And similarly, on the data breach management process, we can help you draw up your management process so that you're covering everything that you need to do in the right order, mitigating the breach, notifying the uh, regulator where needs be. But we can also kind of come in on site in the midst of a breach and help you to actually manage it. And I think at this point, I'm going to hand you over to Bob, who's going to talk you through some of the bigger risks in cybersecurity and give you some quite interesting demos of uh, how these can be exploited. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Just to, uh, just to touch on the GDPR stuff there, I think everything that you've said points to the fact that the worst thing that you can do is nothing. The Information Commissioner's Office knows that no system is perfect, um, but that you know, taking some steps uh, and showing willingness, I think, seems to be a huge thing with them. Yeah, absolutely. I think this phrase they often come out with, it's not if you have a data breach, it's when. Yeah. And if you're prepared and you can demonstrate and you're engaged, you can show that you're shown willing, they'll take a much sort of lighter line on it than if you just look delinquent and uh, ignorant, really. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so on to cybersecurity. Um, what are the big risks? We're, we're often asked uh, by customers and I'm asked, my friends, you know, what are the current big security risks? Um, and while there are trends, um, you know, we've seen an increase in, in more crafted phishing attacks at the moment, for example, the biggest risk um, continues to be the same, the same as it's always been and the same as it always will be, and that is users. Um, users are always going to be targeted by cyber criminals um, because users make common configuration mistakes, users um, are easy to manipulate, they can be socially engineered, um, and it's much easier to target a person than it is to try and you know, hack your way past a sort of a complex security system. Um, users obviously have an online footprint, which is something that we'll, we'll look at briefly during the, the social engineering example that I give you a bit later on. Um, but tools like everything from you know, the, the company's house um, database of directors right through to Google Street View can be really, really valuable resources for cyber criminals to be able to target users. All that stuff's out there. Um, users may not be tech savvy either. So some, uh, some users are, are more easily fooled, can be tricked by things that they see on, on screen, you know, may fall for that phone call from Microsoft. And, and by definition, we're, we're hard coded to be helpful. Um, if, if somebody from IT calls us up and you know, there's a bit of pressure. Oh, we've had this terrible breach. I really need to update your system. Um, can you tell me your password so I can remote in? We're hard coded to be helpful and to try and facilitate that. So users are always the biggest risk. Um, 
and we'll run through how we can uh, how we can help you with that a bit later. So, what can Perfect Image do generally? Um, follow best practices. Customers quite often turn around and say, "Well, you look after our IT, so the IT security is that, that's your job, isn't it?" We do look after the IT infrastructure for a lot of customers. That's absolutely right, but well, as I mentioned around the um, the users piece, it's just a small part of the puzzle. Huge, um, huge swaths of it are covered by policies, procedures, training, reinforcement. Um, the actual technical piece is is just a little bit. Um, we'll always follow the best practices in IT. We proactive monitor, uh, proactively monitor your networks and your systems. We'll patch your servers, but um, there's much more to it than that. So security awareness training is something that Perfect Image are offering now. It's designed to reduce um, user actions that might put your systems at risk, just to make them a little bit more savvy, um, learn how to spot some of the, um, the things that, that some activities people consider to be sort of maybe rather than myths. Um, a lot of what you see in the films is possible, and, and generally a lot more that people don't realize. Cyber criminals are getting more sophisticated as well, and the game shifted a little bit, and it's become more um, lucrative for them to target smaller and smaller businesses as well. So that's having an impact. Now, the cybersecurity awareness training, we really try and um, assist your staff in being able to prevent that and stop them being that sort of weak point on the perimeter of your security. Uh, at the moment, we've got two different cybersecurity awareness sessions we can run. One for general users, one that's, that's more for management and a little bit more technical. Then they take uh, a couple of hours. Um, proactive phishing campaigns. So as I mentioned, this is a, a trend that's continuing. We've all had these emails from you know, perhaps a bank that you don't bank with asking you to, uh, to log in. And they're, they're basically phishing for your login credentials. We've seen instances, um, particularly in the last 12 months, where cyber criminals are targeting specific companies, registering domain names that are very similar um, to company domain names, setting up web hosting, setting up email accounts, all just to try and run a, a phishing attack against you. So what uh, Perfect Image can do now is we actually run um, phishing campaigns against your business and this is a good follow-up piece to the security awareness training uh, and also just provides a little bit more testing, real world, of what cyber criminals will do to try and compromise your organization's security. So we'll send out emails and then we can provide you with reports back on who clicked and then you can, uh, you can choose whether to name or shame those users or to quietly have a word. And uh, finally, we've got the Cyber Essentials Certification. Uh, this is a government initiative launched launched in 2014 but it's it's maturing now uh, it's a fairly low level certification but it's it's a seal of approval that most small businesses um, should be able to achieve and it shows that you take your cybersecurity sort of posture seriously um, the UK central government actually refuses to work with any suppliers now that don't need this um, for most of our customers if we look after your IT a lot of the work is already done so um, after that, it's just a, a small gap analysis just to look at the extra bits that you need to do, perhaps talk with uh, Peter around some policies and procedures to have in place. Okay, so now I get to um, move on to the, the real world threat examples, which is a bit of fun, but also um, a very, very real threat to businesses. So the first one is um, social engineering. Now this is a real example from um, given to me by a social engineer from a conference that I, I went to recently, and the the, the role of um, I'll call her social engineer. She worked for a cyber security firm, and she's not techie at all. She went on the record as saying that she's really just not very good with computers. Her background is psychology, um, but she worked for a cyber security firm that was hired to try and compromise a company's systems. And as we mentioned earlier on, the soft spot is users. So her job is to target users. She was given a very, very simple brief. She was told to try and get uh, a target within a company, let's call her Mrs. Target, to click two links 
uh, well, I, th I think it's three in total, links in an email, just a clicker link. The techies had already set up a whole sort of um, attack behind these links, but her job was just to get Mrs. Target to click links in an email. Now, all she knew about Mrs. Target, all she was given in her brief was the name, um, Mrs. Target, and the company name, that was it. So she's got a little notebook, and this is all she knows at this stage. Now, it's important to note, Mrs. Target was told that this was going to happen. So, you know, she, she was, uh, the, the, the um, defenses were up. You know, she was prepped, she was ready for this attack, and she knew it was coming. So, this is social engineer. She knows the, the target's name is Mrs. Target, and she knows the company's name. So, if anybody fancies uh, chipping in here on the chat, I'd be curious. Does anybody know where a social engineer or hacker might go next? to research a target, if you know the uh, the company's name and, and the name of the person. That's all the info you've got. Let's just see if anybody chimes in. No? Okay, well, LinkedIn, great tool online for, uh, for finding out information about targets. Now, obviously on LinkedIn you can find out position within a company, time at a company. Um, you can almost see geographically where that person has lived because you can see their job history, where they have, um, you know, where they went to uni, where they went to college, where they went to school. It's all good stuff, and obviously associates. So in this instance, the relevant information that uh, Ms. Social Engineer got was that Mrs. Target was the director of the company. So there's a, a useful online database for finding out information about directors. See if anybody knows this one. You can just use the chat if you fancy chipping in. Okay, so it's Company's House. Oh, <laughs> we, there we, we got go. One. We got one. Graham got it just in time. Very good. So yeah, Company's House. Uh, for anybody that hasn't used it, this is a free, completely open, you don't even need to register, database of all companies. I mean, it's all limited companies, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and their offices. So that will be directors um, and company secretaries. Now, what Company's House gives you, as well as the... Um, the position within the business, if you're a, a director or a company secretary, it actually gives you their birth month and birth year, um, which is you know, pretty sensitive information, really. It doesn't give you the day, but I mean, you, at worst case, you've got a 1 in 31 <laughs> chance of getting that right. Um, separately from that, it gives you an address. Now, strictly speaking, this should be changed to the company's registered address or to um, a mailing address, but a lot of people leave it as their personal address. That's what it ends up as. I know that's happened to me in the past. So now she knows Mrs. Target's name, company, position within the company, birth month, year, and address. This is from about five minutes online. Next, Facebook. So she goes onto Facebook and starts researching Mrs. Target, but as we mentioned, Mrs. Target's been warned. Defenses are up. She's got a Facebook settings locked down. Um, Mrs. Target, uh, Mrs. Uh, Social Engineer can't, can't get to anything. But after a bit of sort of sniffing around and using some third party tools that let you query Facebook um, a little easier, she realized, oh, I'll step back, that um, Mrs. Target's son was on Facebook and his privacy settings were not locked down. Now she was able to go through his Facebook feed and see things that pertained to Mrs. Target. She was also able to um, determine that Mrs. Target had a 50th birthday coming up. That gave her the day of Mrs. Target's birthday. And that she had a pet dog and pet dog's name. If I remember rightly, she also used the, the photos from the feed on Facebook combined with the address and Google Street View to confirm that she had the correct address for the home. So, I mean, you think about it with an address in Google Street View, you can look at the outside of somebody's house you can perhaps even get there um, you know, see, see what car they've got. It's, uh, most of the time the, the registrations are thugged out, but um, it's just all more information. Okay. Next, um, Mrs. Social Engineer went on to Google. Now at this stage, she used the information she's got. Um, it was the pet dog. She did a search for vets closest to the address that she had and started calling them. She jumped on the phone, called them up and said, Hi, this is, uh, this is Mrs. Target. I'm calling up about Fluffy's jabs. 
fluffy with his name of the dog and his feet. I can't remember. Uh, and eventually she got a hit. I think it was after maybe two dials. Ah, oh, yeah, Mrs. Target, how is Fluffy? Okay, so now she knows the name of Mrs. Target's vet. Next, she started calling around restaurants closest to that address and asking about her 50th birthday. She, she acknowledged that she, she really lucked out on this one. It was pretty unlikely, but she did actually get through to a restaurant that was hosting her 50th birthday party. Okay, so straight away now, she's got just using these four tools and Google Street View, quite a bit of useful information. And she uses this to send an email to Mrs. Target. She sends one from the vet or purporting to be from the vet. Um, using the vet's logo, the vet's name, the name of the vet, uh, with a link in it. Click here to see Fluffy's most recent uh, treatment invoice. Now, why wouldn't Mrs. Target trust that? It's somebody she knows. They've got all this great, accurate information about her. She clicked the link, sure enough. The next one was an email from the local restaurant. Um, probably something along the lines of click here to confirm your booking. Again, they knew about her booking. They knew her name, 50th birthday party. She gained trust. She built up enough trust in that email that Mrs. Target, even though she was on the lookout for this sort of thing, would click it without thinking. So I found that really interesting um, as a social engineering attack because it's all three tools. There's nothing fancy there. Um, and with social engineer, it isn't technical as such. I mean, she can use these online tools. It's, it's more about the psychology and, and research skills and gaining trust to actually hit your target. So as I say, um, Mrs. Target clicked the links. I think actually what that sent was uh, her to a PDF and the PDF had an exploit in it and then the, the security company basically hacked her machine. And that was it, the breach was complete. So that's an example of a social engineering piece. I'm fairly sure I would get fooled by that one, but I'm supposedly quite aware of this kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah. It's scary, isn't it? And one of the things that we touch on in the security awareness training is, is a lot of this stuff, uh, how to look out for the fake domains, the fake emails, the common tricks that these people will use, and policies and procedures that you can put in place to help avoid it, as well as some technical tools that we can apply. So, now on to the, the hack. This is my favorite bit, this is the fun bit. So there was, um, I think, what is still the biggest data heist of all time um, a few years back. It was the Panama Papers leak. Um, for people that don't know, this is the leak that exposed David Cameron's father, um, the monarchy in some European countries, all um, hiding cash and, and avoiding tax uh, payments in, in offshore jurisdictions. So the company that was attacked was, um, I, think it's a, I think it's a law firm or a trust firm. Law firm, yeah. Law firm, um, Fonseca. Uh, in Panama, since the name. And the exploit happened just through WordPress. And you know, we were talking earlier on about the Dixon's car phone um, hack started off with a WordPress exploit. A lot of the time, something like this just gains you a foothold. And that really is just the start point that a hacker needs to launch a persistent um, attack against um, against a company's sort of infrastructure. A lot of companies make the mistake of thinking that you know their website, well, that, that's outside the network. It's really nothing to do with um, to do with the IT. You know, we've got a firewall and an antivirus. We're, we're safe. What's the work, what's the website got to do with anything? But a lot that foothold can be huge. So I'll give a quick demonstration of how it, it can actually be done. Right, so first of all, we are going to scan a website. In fact, let me show you the company that we're going to target. It's a company called Perfect Mirage, who, as you can see, have a, a fantastic logo and, and brand. This is a WordPress website, and we're going to try and hack into it using just some free tools that are out there. This is the exact hack that happened for uh, Mossack Fonseca. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is scan it using a free tool called WP Scan. Uh, if you Google it, you can find it. Um, I'll just click now, WP Scan. And I've just popped in Perfect Mirage, the domain name of the website that I want to scan for vulnerabilities. You can see WP Scan is um, 
It's actually sponsored by Securi.net. It's a company that um, specializes in website security. Okay, so it's running through the scan. It's found the WordPress version is the latest. It's quite an important fact. Latest version of the WordPress software, no vulnerabilities in the WordPress software at all. But what it has found, if you look here, it's two vulnerabilities found in a plugin, an add-in for WordPress um, called Slider Revolution, the same one that caused the Mossack Fonseca link. Now, not only does it tell me about the vulnerabilities, it gives me links to information about the exploits in detail. And in some cases, there's, there's actually probably some example code out there that I can use to exploit this. So let's have a look how a hacker might go about this. So I know the vulnerability. So now I'll go to my toolkit, Bob's Tools. Just to be clear, this isn't available online. This is <laughs> only on my laptop. So please don't go to tools.bobmckay hoping to get these. I'll go to exploits and WordPress rev slider. I'm just going to copy the domain name of my target company, pop it into my tool here. This just checks if it's vulnerable. OK, so my tool knows that the plugin is vulnerable on this website. Excellent. OK, so now I'm going to try and load something to this website. This is a website that I have no access to, in theory. And I am going to use this vulnerability to get a file that I've chosen onto this web server, onto this website. So I've got a little tool here that I've made. And again, I pop the domain name in. And I just choose the file that I want to upload. I'm going to use one called Bob's Exploit Tool. Now, when I click Submit, my tool gets an update to this plugin software, unzips it, pops the file in that I want to hide, zips it back up, sends it to the website and says, hello, I've got an update here for the Revolution Slider plugin. Revolution Slider plugin's biggest flaw is that it doesn't check if the updates are legit. It just says, thank you very much, and accepts it. Now it unzips that package. And as you can see here, my file is located at perfect-mirage.co.uk, blah, 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 Bob's exploit tool. So I'll click that link. And now if you look at the web address up here, I'm looking at a file that I've put on somebody else's web server, effectively, with no logins, not a great deal of technical trickery. Um, and I found that vulnerability just using a free tool for WordPress called WP Scan. Okay, so what can I do with this now? A lot, actually. Um, once you've got a foothold like this on a web server, you can kill the website. It's very, very simple. Um, but most hackers, as I say, will use this as a foothold. So I'm going to do that. I um, made my tool have a little sniff around automatically whenever it's uploaded to a web server. And what it's done here is found a file called wp-config. This is the file that contains all the good stuff about a WordPress installation. So WordPress makes a website easy to manage by storing all the information in a database. And here, I've got all the information about this company's database. I've got the database name, which I'll pop over here into my tool. I've got the username, great stuff. I've got the address of the server. And more importantly, I've got the password to log into the database. Great. Now, if I wanted to just destroy this website, I can type one command and click connect and execute. I've got to be careful not to click here. <laughs> um, oh, no, sorry, drop all tables. And that tells the database to delete all data, absolutely everything. That website is, is gone. That, that's a bit obvious, but people tend to notice when their website stops uh, displaying. So what tends to happen is hackers will be a bit sneaky. Now, I've got a command to reset the admin account. Now, just to show that this isn't pre-prepared, can somebody give me a password on the chat? If anybody wants just to throw in a word, and I'll update the admin password to that word. 
Do you think I'd be used to this one? Now? <laughs> I might have to get you to give me. There we go. Oh, sausages. Okay, thank you, Rowan. Right, so I'm going to change the password of the administrator of the admin account to this website to sausages. I spell that correctly. Now, as a security feature, WordPress uh, randomly changes table names in the database to make it more difficult to exploit. Unfortunately, that information is just stored in this file. Uh, it's not hugely effective. I just need to change one more thing in my command. Okay, so here's a command I'm going to send to the database of this website. Change the password of admin to sausages. Okay, right? No error. It's a very simple tool. If you don't get an error, it means it's worked. Let's see if we can log into the um, into the back end of this website and tinker. Okay, so I'm going to go to admin. This is the standard login. I'm going to log in. Go to admin. I'll tell you what. I'll copy and paste that password so you can see it is the real one. Okay, copy. Paste. This is when it doesn't work. The problem with live <laughs> demos. Log in. Okay, and we're in. So in what's got to be under five minutes. We scanned a website, found a vulnerability, a well-known one, used a well-known exploit tool, changed the admin password, and logged in. And now we can install plugins, we can grab information about contact forms, um, we can install our own contact form and, and just grab all the information that other people submit. We could install um, crypto miner software, so anybody that goes your website is mining cryptocurrency for us using their PC's processing power. Or we could throw malware on there. So anybody that visits your website, the website attempts to deploy a virus into their machines. All sorts of fun stuff. Now the uh, the Mossack Fonseca hack that we talked about, the, um, the hackers actually used a script like this to get information about an email account in the company, sat on that email account, used that to grab huge amounts of information. From there, they also found out about another website tool that the company were using, and they hacked that in a very similar way. And I think they sat on this for 18 months, just siphoning off information. And it all started with such a simple um, exploit. And as you can see, to update WordPress and WordPress plugins, it's just a link. It takes five minutes, but if the policy and procedure is in place and a clear definition of who's supposed to do it, Things like this. Okay, so um, back to the slideshow. That's uh, the end of the cybersecurity piece, I think. So just to summarize. Yes, just a few little additional pieces to kind of look out for over the next six to 12 months, particularly in the world of GDPR and uh, privacy. Just when you thought it was safe to send out your marketing emails, we have the soon-to-be-revised e-privacy regulation, which is currently wending its ever-so-slow way through the European Union. Um, I think there are currently about three different versions of this, so we don't know exactly what it's going to mean for certainly business-to-business -business and business-to-consumer marketing. But it's definitely one to keep an eye on. I'll be personally following it to make sure we can get some kind of definitive notes and guidance available as soon as there is a real clear indication of where they're going with this regulation. Another big thing, uh, some people might be aware of it, they might not, they might not have seen this in the news recently, but uh, there's something called Brexit happening in the next six months or so. It does have implications for data protection. When the UK leaves and when the transition period is over, the UK becomes a third country, which means that no longer is there free movement of data between the UK and the EU. We need to put in place different measures. The UK is hoping for something called an adequacy arrangement, which means that our law is essentially equivalent to EU law and the EU recognises that, but it becomes slightly more tricky if there's no Brexit deal. 
and the government have actually released a guidance note for companies to explain the options available to them. Obviously, if you're trading with the EU, a lot of that trade is going to involve the passage of data to and fro, and you need that to happen freely. So this note gives you some options from the government as to how you might actually make sure that happens in the interim between, hopefully, an adequacy arrangement coming into place. And finally, just uh, another set of useful guidance that you might be interested in. The ICO has business-specific GDPR guidance that they regularly update. They've recently released a couple of updates this week on, I think it was passwords and encryption, which are quite pertinent to the discussion we've just had around cybersecurity. So a website for you to check out has useful information for you. Okay. And cybersecurity, uh, just to wrap up, um, contact us about any of the services we mentioned, uh, the phishing campaigns, uh, general consultancy. Um, I think especially the cybersecurity awareness training um, as it relates to GDPR. I mean, I, I think companies that have that have trained staff um, in security awareness are seen very favourably by the ICO. Absolutely. I think it's a common theme throughout most of the enforcement notices they've issued is the, one of the first things they look for is staff training. And if you haven't done that, they will make you do it. Mm -hmm. But if you have and can demonstrate that you have done that, they'll definitely look upon you more favourably. Okay, excellent. And we've had really good feedback from the um, the awareness training sessions, two hours long, and we, we, we try to keep them fairly entertaining, but with a reasonable level of depth as well. So. Um, and finally, for the Cyber Essential certification that we mentioned, um, there's the link to the, the government's official sort of resource, as well as information about the, the certification. There's also just good information there in general about um, cybersecurity. Okay. So I don't know if anybody has any questions at this stage. Yeah, realise that uh, due to a slightly late start, due to sound issues, we've kind of hit our yeah, one hour slot, but uh, we're, we're happy to sit here for a little while and answer any questions anybody has. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, just while we're seeing if anybody does pipe up, I believe that this webinar is automatically recorded and we can uh, we can make it available to anybody that might want to pass it on to anyone uh, that might be interested in the information around the GDPR or taking a peek at some of the cybersecurity stuff. So just fire, uh, fire an email over to us and let us know. Yeah, and if, you, if any questions or queries come to you in the uh, hours after this webinar and you suddenly think, oh, I wish I'd asked that, I'm happy to kind of take them on board and give you a few little answers and guidance. Okay, I see nobody piping up, so I figure we'll, uh, we'll leave it there as we've hit the 12 o'clock. So. Okay, thanks for attending, everybody. Yeah, thanks for your time. Okay, take care.